Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 13th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we take a look at the status of the AKLNG project and evaluate whether it is quote, closer than ever, close quote, as some claim. Second, we look at Alaska House candidate Cliff Groh's proposed fiscal plan and how it measures up against the 2021 Legislative Working Group proposal. And third, Michael and I discuss our reactions to the outcome thus far of the special primary election, including the insights it may provide into some coming legislative races. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to start off with the governor's new push for a gas line. Um, And uh, you're wondering, is this uh, real or is it a political ploy? This is shades of Bill Walker all over it at some point. But uh, what say you? Well, speaking of Bill Walker, he uh, he couldn't resist the opportunity to have a op ed in the ADN over the weekend on the on the subject as well. Oh, sure. Uh, the thing the thing that triggered me is an article in the ADN that Nat Hurt, Hertz wrote says, as energy markets spiral up, a gas pipeline could be closer than ever. Alaska politicians say this is about the you know fiftieth time that the gas pipeline has been closer than ever. Uh, and, uh, I always remember and, that. And it, I always remember that, uh, Jim Whitaker photo, uh, former mayor of Fairbanks who had a framed copy of the 1953. It was either the Fairbanks daily news Miner or the Anchorage daily news. It was a big full page thing that says gas line coming in like a year or two years or whatever. And it was fr- It was 1953. It was just, you know, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Just around the corner. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the, it's the never ending uh, quest for a, for a gas pipeline. This, this article focuses on a, a, a trade trip that the governor took to Japan uh, to reach out to Japanese, both the Japanese government and uh, Japanese uh, uh, distributors, Japanese gas companies to establish, relate, establish contacts and, and try to push the gas line uh, along. And it's frankly, it's not a bad time to put uh, the gas line to, 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 to remind everybody that Alaska has gas and and that there is a project that uh, that is is setting over here uh, potentially to to come on board as a result of the Ukraine uh, uh, war, as a result of Europe uh, trying to uh, move out of Russian gas, and with Russian gas uh, redeploying uh, uh, possibly to China, um, and with U.S. gas, U.S. Gulf Coast gas, which frankly was built on the backs of of, of exports to Asia, exports to China. With U.S. gas, Gulf Coast gas redeploying to Europe to sort of fill the gap that uh, uh, that uh, uh, Russia uh, played, the role that Russia played in, in providing gas to Europe, uh, Asia is sort of the odd man out in all this. I mean, non-China Asia uh, is sort of the odd man out in all this, and it's it's not a bad time for the governor to to take the trip and to. Uh, and to you know, seek to you know keep keep in the forefront of everybody's mind the potential for a, uh, for an Alaska project, but it's not. I mean, to say that the pipeline could be closer than ever, uh, frankly, is uh, is is a reach. The economics are still hugely challenged uh, of a gas line. The the construction costs that 
Uh, as recently as a couple of years ago, we're estimated at, at below $40 billion are likely escalating again uh, with, uh, with the price of steel and, 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 and inflation in general going up. We're seeing that a lot in the oil industry. Uh, elsewhere, uh, where uh, costs of goods are, are escalating again uh, because of the contraction of the, of the, uh, uh, of the employment, uh, contraction of people uh, focused on the oil industry. We're seeing employment costs uh, uh, escalating. So we're probably talking about uh, a, a project cost that's now well north of, uh, of $40 billion, possibly even approaching uh, $50 billion, possibly a, a, a substantial increase uh, in the cost of the project. And we're talking about challenged economics on the market side also. While current gas prices, LNG prices in Europe and in Asia, because we now have a world market, are, are above $20 uh, and sometimes above $30, uh, an MMBTU, uh, and you know the, the Alaska gas pap pipeline in the past is, or the LNG project has been penciled out at around uh, sub $8. So while that looks good currently, when you look at the futures market for LNG, um, the Asian market uh, goes back below $8, uh, goes back to $7 uh, by 2025, about the time that the Alaska project would come online. So it, what the market is saying is these things are going to work out. We're going we're to bring on additional LNG supply. We're going to have some contraction of demand. Uh, uh, in the world, um, and prices are going are to come back down into, into lower levels. So you, you know, the economics continue to be continue to be challenged. To think that because of the reordering of the of the gas world, because of Europe's pull now on U.S. Gulf Coast supplies, um, and, and and because of of the retraction of of, of, of Russian supplies. To think that that is suddenly going to make the Alaska gas pi pi pipeline economic is just going too far. The economics still matter, um, and, and we have to prove that the economics uh, are going to work. There is one other opportunity here, and I think the Dunleavy administration is right for reaching out to try to see if they can, if they can pick up on it. There's an opportunity for a strategic players, somebody who's not as concerned about overall uh, market economics, but somebody who's concerned a lot about supply, uh, there's an opportunity for a strategic player to, uh, to come into uh, Alaska. One thing, one thing that there's some doubt about in the lower 48, backing up all of these LNG projects in the lower 48, is whether there's sufficient supply at an economic price to supply all these LNG projects over the long term. We don't have to worry about supply in Alaska. We know where the supply is. We right. know uh, have, have a good handle on how much there is of it. Um, and also, we have the advantage, we can probably do a fixed price or, or, a, or, a, or an escalated price, a non-market related price uh, on the supply end. I mean, it's, we, we, the, the pipeline and the kit is going to be a fairly fixed cost once you install it. It's going to be a high cost, but a fairly fixed cost. Once you install it, the gas is otherwise stranded. It's not being pulled on by other markets. Uh, and so that is susceptible to a long-term, fairly fixed price uh, contract. So we can offer a secure, a secure supply at a relatively stable price. And some, some purchasers are going to find that attractive. Right. Uh, and, and, and matching that strategic advantage that we, and we're also on the Pacific Ocean, which is an advantage. We're on the other side of the, of the Pan Panama Canal from the U.S. Gulf Coast projects. So that matching, matching those strategic advantages with the market uh, is an opportunity. I, I think it's a stretch to say that uh, it, we're farther along, closer than we've ever been before, but we're not, we're not at, at ground zero. We have, we have certain advantages that we, that we need to play up. Well, so let's rank it then. This, uh, this discussion, there are some good things, as you said, but if you were ranking it uh, you know, on a percentile rate, is this uh, 50, 60 percent just kind of campaign rhetoric, hyperbole uh, with a few functional factors of truth in there? Or what, what do you say? Yeah, I'd say it's mostly campaign hyperbole. It's not I, I wouldn't I wouldn't attribute the timing of this entirely to campaign hyperbole. As I say, the Ukrainian war has has changed the dynamic in the gas market 
in a way that is is important to understand and important to uh, to reach out and connect with sort of the new players. Japan had sort of become less important as the as the significance of China in the LNG market grew, but with Russian gas likely redeploying to China, China in terms of Western supply is 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 of decreasing importance. Japan is is back on is back on the ascendancy. So reaching out to Japan, I think I think is a is a timely move. It happens to coincide with the campaign, but but the governor should not overplay his hand, and and people should not have huge expectations uh, arising out of this. You know. Walk, Walker's op-ed over the weekend sort of said, "Hey, I was there first. I was the first thinking about this. I, you know, if you reelect me, I'm going to <laughs> yeah, of course, be back in office. I'm going to I'm going to follow through on it." Yes, yes. This campaign should not turn on on who people think is going to deliver a gas pipeline. That's not that's not where this is. It's it's in a situation where the market is changing. Alaska has some has some opportunities. Alaska has some advantages that we need to that we need to push um, and 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 a and a responsible governor should be among those who are pushing it um, but we don't need somebody we don't need walker or we don't need somebody coming around saying oh and 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 we need to get behind it and subsidize it we need to build it because you know it's going to be economic and all that sort of stuff it's not it, it is we we need to what we need to do is find a strategic player who <clears throat> values the 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 fact the gas is there and values the potential for a relatively fixed price uh, contract and focus in on finding that strategic player and let them lead the project, not us, but let them right. uh, lead the project. Because if they become invested in it, if they invest their money in it, yeah, uh, then, then they're going to develop it. Lots of pitfalls to the government-led project. We've seen it. It hasn't worked. It's uh, it's a hot mess, and we don't need to be getting in the middle of that right now. But encouraging it is something completely different. We've got to a shut-in gas supply in this state, like a trillion cubic feet of gas. And, I mean, that is one of the biggest gas reserves in the world. And it just seems like we're just sitting on it like, well, one day we'll need it. I mean, when the citizens of Alaska are struggling, they're talking about already having record fuel oil prices come this fall and everything else. And, I mean, again, the Constitution calls that the resources of the state should be uh, you know, uh, uh, developed for the maximum benefit of the citizens and the residents. And some of the legislature has just basically defined that as making as much money for the state government as possible instead of providing them with cheap. Of, I mean, the difference when I moved down to the South Central, a personal story. When I moved down to the South Central area, I literally in the first eight months alone saved five thousand dollars just in utilities, maybe even a little bit more than that. And the first year, I guarantee you, I saved $7,000 plus on utilities. Just, I mean, the heating and the electricity alone were dramatically different. The poor people in Fairbanks, I don't even, I don't even know what to say to these people. Uh, because, you know, if you start talking about having to pay six, seven dollars a gallon for heating oil, I mean, who's got seven grand just laying around to fill a thousand gallon fuel tank that may get you through the winter, may not. It's insane. Well, Michael, the 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 LNG plant is not the solution to that. I mean, the, the, the LNG project is not the solution to all that. If if we build the LNG project because we want to supply South Central and Fairbanks with gas, the the unit cost is going to far exceed your five thousand dollar savings. It's probably going to double or triple uh the the price uh by well, the no, time we build all of the yeah we need it for export to, uh, we need it for here. yeah we need it for export but there can always be you know takeoffs from the major export line we, i mean it's eventually going to have to happen we're eventually going to have to draw that gas off the slope uh and and have the opportunity again to feed some of these other communities at takeoff points but i mean shouldn't that eventually be something that you know we're working towards well, I think the, I think everybody has worked. Toward, I mean, they've tried to make the LNG project work the, for a long time. The, for a long time, the solution was to build the gas line to the lower 48, right, and and to have takeoff points on the gas line that went through that would go through Canada and go down and supply the lower 48. But shale gas, the shale revolution uh, in the uh, in the mid 2000s, late 2000s, early 20 teens, uh, uh, destroyed that. I mean, it, it 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 provided tons of gas down in the lower 48, and so the the market. 
for Alaska gas, that market for Alaska gas went away. We shifted and started focusing on LNG, but there are economic realities related to LNG as well. Yes, the North Slope gas supply is huge. Uh, when BP still owned it, it was the largest undeveloped resource in, uh, in BP's worldwide uh, portfolio. But it has to be economic to, to deliver to markets. And, and what we found is there are other gas supplies globally, uh, including in the U.S. Gulf Coast, that can beat it uh, on price, given the, uh, given the amount of, uh, of kit we have to build to, to bring it down to the lower 48. The infrastructure, bring to, right. Bring it down to, to, to water, tidewater in, uh, in Alaska. So it's, I mean, it has to be economic. It has to be economic on the world market in order to justify building the kit. Yes, there are advantages to Alaska, to Fairbanks and to Anchorage. Uh, uh, if, we, if we bring it down, we can't bring it, we can't afford to bring it down solely for that. Frankly, you know, when, when we talk about the Cook Inlet running short of gas, the solution to that, if in fact the Cook Inlet is running short of gas, the solution to that is going to be LNG imports uh, into the Cook Inlet uh, to the extent we're going to continue to have uh, needs for, uh, for natural gas. Uh, it's not economic to build that to build a line down from the lower 48 just to meet Alaska markets. And to get it into international markets, it has to meet economics. As I say, the one opportunity out there is a strategic player, not necessarily looking for the cheapest gas, but looking for a secure gas source that can be delivered at a relatively fixed price um, uh, over the life, not tied to other markets, not tied to other LNG prices, a strategic player looking for that. And I think, you know, I, th I think, there is a potential that we find a strategic player like that. And I think the governor, the last governor, this governor, every governor is right uh, to go forward and, uh, and, and try to you know, find, that, find that matchup. But until we find that matchup, we shouldn't be thinking that, you know, we just got to do whatever it takes to bring that gas supply down. Um, should we have built the gas pipeline? Uh, uh, I only have about 40 seconds here, but should we have built the gas pipeline 30 years ago? Should we have just bitten the bullet and done it or... Uh, you know, in hindsight? Well, yeah, hindsight's 2020. Um, it, it, it probably wouldn't have been an economic, pro well, it wouldn't have been an economic project if built at that time. It would have turned out, you know, 30 years ago, it would have turned out maybe two thirds the way through its life, it would have become economic, but we would have had, whoever built it would have had substantial losses yeah, gotta... uh, dur during, the, during the first part. Let's move on to number two, which is... Uh... Cliff Grow, uh, candidate, uh, perennial PFD smasher. Uh, he's got a plan. He's put it up. T give me the, give me the, your take on it here. Well, there's a op-ed. Cliff wrote an op-ed in uh, in the ADN over the weekend entitled "My Plan to Grow G R O H," a play on his name, uh, the permanent fund uh, and dividend. And he outlines a fiscal plan that I think is worth talking about. It it in a in a very broad scope. Uh, it's within the it's within the parameters of what the uh, legislative working group uh, uh, talked about. It's got some of the same elements of that. I think it I think it it falls short of meeting the 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 goals of the legislative uh, working group uh, plan. But it's got it's got some some of the right. Um, it talks about some of the right pieces. It talks about preserving the PFD. It talks about a spending cap, his, his plan, his op-ed talks about a spending cap, talks about oil taxes, and he talks about uh, individual taxes. But when you follow through and sort of pick on those individual parts, uh, it leaves something, uh, leaves something to be desired. And let's get into, we've got about three minutes here, so let's get into some of the specifics. We'll break it down and I'll stop you when we get to the break here, but let's, uh, you know, let's start at the top here. What, you know, sure. what does he get right? What does he get wrong specifically? Well, he talks about the P he talks about a PFD, preserving the PFD. And I think that's I think that's We've heard that he before. We've heard about. that before by the uh, way, the whole preserving the PFD pitch. We've heard that from everybody from Walker on down. So, or do you yep. think it means what do you yeah. what, what do you think it means or what what he doesn't talk about is is uh, is preserving a, a given PFD. I mean, within the confines of the of the words he uses, you could have everything from a a full statutory PFD to a twenty-five seventy-five PFD. What the what the House tried to tried to propose, uh, and what uh, Senator Stedman tried to propose uh, last legislative session. What the working group talked about was POMV fifty-fifty. They talked about the governor's proposal of POMV fifty-fifty, 
an even split of the earnings stream between the PFD uh, and uh, and government. It's it's less, frankly, than a lower PFD than what uh, than what the current statute provides. But it is a it is a landing spot that makes some sense. I've said it. I've said it one point that I think it's what Governor Hammond actually originally uh, intended. Um, but Cliff doesn't Cliff doesn't land on a P, on a POMB fifty fifty. He doesn't land on any particular size PFD. It's just sort of yeah, we ought to continue to have a PFD, and that's important. Um, and I you know acknowledging that is is useful. But I think I think candidates who really you know candidates who are worth following, candidates who are worth uh, uh, supporting are those who are going to step up to what the legislative working group outlined of a, of a POMB 5050 PFD. Right. Uh, you mentioned he did talk about oil taxes as well, which is part of the uh, uh, part of the uh, discussion for the fiscal policy working group, something that you've taken a little heat over because you're a former oil and gas attorney. So everybody automatically assumes that you must be against anything new, but you've said, no, there is definitely a place there's, you know, two or three or $400 million still available on the table that would, not make it unattractive, and it should be something that's uh, at least explored and talked about. And Cliff acknowledges that uh, in the piece as part of his plan. Again, he doesn't talk about any particular amount or any particular structure, but talks about a, about a contribution of, of of oil taxes. The governor uh, in the in the Department of Revenue's fiscal model, the governor has outlined some steps you could take to uh, to update uh, the oil taxes. And, and as I've talked about in the past. Uh, with the with the enactment of the two hundred or the twenty seventeen uh, tax act, corporate tax act, corporate taxes uh, were reduced. We didn't adjust the Alaska tax system to to recognize the reduction in federal income taxes. So there are there are adjustments that can and should be made uh, to the oil tax structure. Again, Cliff doesn't talk about any particulars, but at least he keep, but but at least he opens uh, opens the topic. We're working through the weekly top three. We were halfway through number two, Cliff Grow's PFD plan. Uh, does it match up to the fiscal policy working group? We had already been through the oil taxation issue and the and the question of uh, fixing a PFD. Uh, what else is good versus bad in uh, this opinion piece, Brad? Well, I think one thing that surprised people um, surprises people about about Cliff mentioning it. Uh, Cliff is. Uh, is is widely viewed viewed as more to the left uh, than uh, than maybe the average uh, Alaskan, certainly the average Alaskan uh, listening to this program. Um, I think one thing that surprises Cliff mentions in the in the uh, piece uh, a spending cap, um, and I think part of that is a realistic recognition on his part uh, that in order to get support for various other pieces uh, of the plan, that there that a spending cap needs to be part of that. But I think that's a I think that's a good sign uh, that even somebody like Cliff is is talking about a spending cap. Certainly, a spending cap was part of spending cap and spending reductions were part of the fiscal policy working group proposal. Um, and I think Cliff uh, mentioning that now he doesn't talk about the specifics of a spending cap. He doesn't talk about you know a revenue based versus a spending based. He doesn't talk about inflation versus other approaches to a spending cap. Um, so he doesn't he doesn't fill in the blanks of, of what kind of spending cap he has in mind, but I think the mere mention of a spending cap is something that uh, that's a positive uh, coming out of uh, coming out of uh, that side of the aisle. The final thing uh, that he includes in there, and the thing he is most specific about, uh, is uh, taxes, uh, individual taxes. Right. Um, and it's it's interesting. Uh, he doesn't establish a baseline for a PFD. He doesn't talk about what percent of PFD or what size of PFD he's talking about. He doesn't talk about the specifics of a spending cap. He doesn't talk about the specifics of an oil tax, but he does talk about the specifics of what he has in mind for uh, for income taxes. And it's a uh, and and it's on people uh, uh, earning two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more. It's sort of like the Biden proposal, right? That that Biden said, you know, we're going to increase taxes on people earning four hundred thousand uh, dollars or more. Cliff's version of that is we're going to do taxes on people earning two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. And I, I I did some analysis of that. Basically, he's talking about the top five percent. When you go to the IRS data, the most recent IRS data that's out there, and you break it down by for Alaska, uh, you break it down by income bracket, uh, that matches two hundred fifty thousand and above. 
uh, is about uh, the top 5%. And to raise 500 million uh, from the top 5%, uh, which is usually the standard that, well, it's the standard that ICER, that, that ITEP used in their 2017 study, what are, what's the cost or what's the impact of $500 million increments. To raise $500 million from the top 5% would require a tax rate, flat tax rate, or an average tax rate of about 7%. Um, so it's it's a very top end oriented right um, top end oriented approach and the and the interesting thing about it would be you would assuming he's talking about POMV fifty fifty or something that has some change in the current PO, PFD statute you would talk you would talk about you would be talking about taking money from the from the other eighty percent the the bottom eighty percent through PFD cuts you'd be talking about taking money from the top 5% through this uh, income tax. And then, but, but people between the top 20% and the top 5%, that 15% bracket would, wouldn't get hit with hardly anything. I mean, they, PFD cuts wouldn't affect them much. They wouldn't be reached by the income tax. So you'd have this donut hole that sits, uh, sits between those two brackets that would, uh, that would largely avoid uh, uh, contributing to the state. I think the I think the, the 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 problem with that approach, the problem with the let's tax everybody two hundred fifty thousand dollars and above. I think the problem with that approach is it's not broad based. I mean, remember that when the when the uh, uh, when the legislative working group talked about taxes, they talked about broad based taxes, and broad based means it reaches a lot of people so that there's a big divisor, and so that the impact on any one individual or any one group. Uh, is relatively small because you're spreading it out among right. a huge uh, a huge group. When you focus it on the two hundred fifty thousand dollars and above, that's not a that's not a broad based tax. That's a that's a narrowly targeted tax, just like the PFD tax. PFD cuts are narrowly it just right. It just uh, cuts right. on the other side of the spectrum. It cuts on the opposite side of the spectrum. I think the fiscal policy working group talked about a two and a half two two and a half percent statewide sales tax. Actually, they talked about two different numbers, but I think it was two and a half to four or something like that, wasn't it? Well, that's what Mike Shower talked about. Uh, yeah. the, the, the fiscal policy working group wasn't as specific uh, on that as a shower, uh, shower has been. And as we've talked about on the program, sales taxes have their own problems. I mean, they're regressive, regressive right? Not, not, not to the same extent as PFD cuts, but they're, right. they're nonetheless regressive and shove shove the burden down to middle and lower income Alaska families. I, I think the net on net, Cliff's approach, Cliff's approach is a step forward. Cliff's uh, uh, op-ed is a step forward because it puts down on paper something that, that few candidates are doing, which is a plan, a thought process right. for how we address the fiscal policy, fiscal policy going forward. I think it's a good step forward because it touches the base of, uh, of, of the various things that the fiscal policy working group does. I think where it where it falls short is it doesn't have the specifics. It doesn't establish the baseline for a PF, for what he means by a PFD. Doesn't establish the baseline for oil taxes. Doesn't establish the the baseline for a spending for a spending cap, and establishes too narrow a baseline for a broad based taxes. I think so, to be to be the plan. So you want to see a more specificity in this, uh, and specifically on all those other options as well, and a more broad based plan. Uh, like your proposed right. flat tax that you've talked about in the past. Okay. Uh, let's move on to number three. Number three is your take on the special primary. we got about three minutes here, three and a half minutes. So uh, what's your take on the preliminary results from the special primary? Well, I think, uh, I think everybody's going to have their own individual take. We have to remember that only about 50% of the votes have been counted. Uh, evidently we're having a problem with, uh, with uh, uh, uncounted ballots or, or, or uh, unallowed ballots uh, out west uh, in the in the bush. The rejected the uh, 20, uh, 19, 18% of rejected ballots in the bush. Yeah, right. Um, I think I think it, it. I think the too soon to tell theme is a uh, is appropriate here. And even even once we get the final four uh, out of this primary, I think the too soon to tell theme is still going to be appropriate. I mean, one thing that's going on with these undercounted with these with these ballots rejected in the bush. I think Tara Sweeney's vote count is going to be low, uh, lower than it otherwise would be uh, if we if we had those Bush ballots uh, uh, counted. So I think even if she doesn't make the final four, I think she's going to have a good basis to say we're going to continue on to the next primary uh, in August, <laughs> the primary for the for the full term of the seat. 
uh, and we're going to keep campaigning. So I, we may have narrowed it down to the top five. We may have narrowed it down maybe to the top six, uh, depending upon if somebody wants to continue on after that. But I don't think we've, I don't think, I think we're far away from seeing the end game of how this is going to play out. And frankly, I think the fact that we're having so many rejected ballots this time, I think uh, because part in part because of mail in voting, uh, I think, I think we're going to see potentially see different results in August when we do this by going, when we do it regularly by going to the, the polling, uh, the polling place. So I, I, I don't think this special primary is, is solving the issue of who's going to be, uh, who's, on, who's going to ultimately emerge from, uh, uh, from this election cycle on, the, on, on who takes the seat uh, for the full term. It's going to be interesting to see who continues ahead, even if they don't make it into the top four or five into the next primary. And of course, that's going to be even confusing in and of itself because you'll have the regular special election on the same day as the regular primary, apparently on the same ballot, according to Fanumi. Uh, it's going to be a hot mess is what I'm calling it. I'm going to trademark that hot mess. I will say that it was kind of nice to see, Brad, that there was, this was, uh, if you had any question about the business as usual crowd, there was some serious repudiation in my mind uh, on some of the candidates, specifically uh, talking about um, uh, Josh Revac and John Coghill, both of whom had a, well, it's an abysmal showing for somebody with such, you know, people who have got, you know, name recognition and incumbency and everything else. I mean, these are people who are you know, prototypical of the smaller PFD, big government. It seems like that they were, I mean, to me, it was a repudiation when you only get 2% of the vote. That pretty much says something for you right there. Yeah, and Adam add, uh, Adam Wold to that. I yeah. mean, Adam thought uh, he had a base in Fairbanks uh, that was going to give him, uh, you know, a, a fairly huge vote count to, to make it to the to the final four, and he falls in the same category. I think I think of those three, Coghill had the most at two point some odd percent. Right. Josh was Josh right behind him. Were down in the yeah. one point some odd uh, one point some odd percent. All three of them, uh, you know, PFD cutters uh, from their legislative days. So I, yeah, I, I, I take some encouragement of that. I think, uh, you know, the fact that former governor Palin is leading, uh, leading the, the, the vote count right now is a, is a, is to some degree a repudiation of the establishment uh, Republicans who seem to have lined up behind uh, Nick Begich. Um, Al Gross is a, is a repudiation of the, of the Democrats. Uh, Mary Peltola is a, is a repudiation of, a, of also the Democrat, the named Democrat candidate, Chris Constant. Um, yeah, I, 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 Alaska is showing its traditional uh, independence uh, in that regard. But right. it's, it, you're right; it's got to be crushing for you know Revac, who gave up his seat in the in the legislature, uh, and for Coghill, who thought you know that uh, his loss to uh, Rob Myers was a fluke, and that you know all he had to do was get out there again, and he'd be restored. It's got to be crushing for them. Well, it was interesting because especially Revac. I mean, he just kind of like. He vaporized like two weeks, three weeks before the uh, actual. I mean, he made the announcement that he was the named successor to Don Young. Don Young's widow came out and said the same thing. And I think he expected some kind of bump from that. But then nothing, nothing. And he just kind of disappeared. Yeah, there's never been a it's never struck me that there's a there there with Josh Reback. I mean, he was he was. Uh, uh, he signed the, you know, the PFD pledge. He was going to support the PFD. Then Kathy Giesel got a hold of him, and you know, he he became a PFD cutter and questioned why we have PFDs. And it, there was there was never. I mean, he has an outstanding military record. Uh, you can't you can't argue right. with that. But there was just never a there there in terms in terms of policy. And it, um, you know, I, I think I think people sort of caught on to that and you know wondered whether he was the right person to uh, to put up in Congress. Yeah, no, it's definitely interesting. And again, yeah, I mean, because we heard a lot about that uh, from folks. I mean, we being me, uh, the royal we. Uh, we heard a lot about that from Coghill in that area that, you know, oh, this was just a fluke. I mean, this guy just came out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, it's a, so I said, people really do support me. And blah, blah, blah. and then, I mean, just pile on. I think people are starting to get... Um, uh, I think people are starting to understand that it was kind of the business as usual crowd and their positions have, have uh, been pretty much outed at this point and they may be radioactive. I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the primary between 
uh, uh, Holland, Roger Holland and Kathy Geisel. That, to me, is going to be an interesting primary. Because the primaries are pretty much useless at this point. There's only one House district that has more than five candidates in it anyway. So these are really just going to be kind of a test poll for what's going to be happening in November. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see if there's a repudiation there as well with Kathy Geisel and if that style, that philosophy in the legislature is actually dead. Yeah, I uh, I, I agree. And, and you know, I... I place a lot of I place a lot of significance on Adam Wool's showing. Also, I mean, Adam styled himself as a as a hard, independent, you know, thinker looking out for Alaskans, looking out for Alaska families, looking out for you know uh, uh, the people who need uh, who who need government, people who benefit from government, and you know he, he didn't even poll well in Fairbanks, right? Um, right. So. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I think that is a repudiation in, in Adam's case, as well as John's case, as well as uh, Josh's case. And I think it says good things that about, you know, what Alaskans really feel about uh, about these uh, about these PFD cutting uh, uh, candidates. Well, and, I, and you're right. Giesel, Giesel Holland's going to be a great uh, a great race uh, for that as well. Well, and, and again, I think that you're seeing, again, just a snapshot, I think, of what's going to be coming this fall. I think that people are more and more frustrated with the whole business as usual crowd with the, you know, we cut everything at the expense of the uh, 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 private sector to benefit the public sector. And I think that that comes through. And I think people, I think they're fed up. I think they've had enough of it. I agree with you that the voting for Palin was more a repudiation of the of the status quo and the business as usual crowd uh, more than anything else. And I think that there's some leeriness with baggage just because of his name and everything else. But um, I think that, you know, overall, uh, I think you're seeing a snapshot of what's coming this November uh, across the country. Yeah, I, we, I just don't think we've seen the full picture yet. I mean, I, I think I think Tara, I think we're going to see a native vote. Uh, that we haven't a, a cohesion to a native vote that we haven't seen maybe since Murkowski's write-in campaign. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think it's, it's sort of slow moving in the case of Tara, but I think we're going to see her continue to the, uh, to the, at least to the August primary continue to try to build up support for, uh, for the long term. Um, and I think I think that's going to make a difference uh, as well. So, well, I think a, the Pol- the Peltola Sweeney race, you know, kind of battle there is going to be interesting for sure to see which one captures the hearts and minds of the bush uh, and the native communities for sure. Uh, Brad, we're out of time. Thanks for coming on board and joining us. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.